wherever you're coming in from on this WOW Global 24, we've kind of constructed it so that you're either awake or not gone to bed yet, so you can hear a conversation that is going to be led by Angela Davis. And I say that because we are at a stage with COVID and Black Lives Matter where we have an opportunity to really reflect on how we create a hopeful revolution in terms of the way that communities can rethink justice, rethink social justice. And to do that, we need somebody who has spent time, effort, intellectual vigor and rigor and applied it to all of these questions over many years. And Angela absolutely is the outstanding person in this way. I, she doesn't need introducing, but out of respect, I will introduce her. She's a scholar, an activist, a writer. She's a distinguished professor emerita of history of consciousness and feminist studies at the at University of California, Santa Cruz. Her work as an educator, both at the university level and in the larger public sphere, has always emphasized the importance of building communities of struggle for economic, racial, and gender justice. She's an author of over 10 books. She is somebody who has changed everybody's thinking if they've come near enough to listen and learn. And, and I have had the privilege of listening and learning from her over many years, and I'm profoundly grateful for that. So I'm coming to you now, Angela, to ask you, as you look across these sort of spikes in pandemic moments, but perhaps more powerfully, spikes in terms of social consciousness, spikes in terms of civic uprising, can you tell me at this point whether you feel that something has fundamentally shifted in the conversation that could be enduring in terms of social justice? What are you seeing? What do you hope for? And, and what do you feel we need to do if we have hope to sustain the hope? Well, first of all, Jude, thank you so much for inviting me to participate um, in this global event. Um, this is an extraordinary moment. I don't know whether I've ever experienced um, any single moment, historical moment, uh, uh, with such global resonances. Uh, um, and it seems that uh, when the pandemic, uh, when COVID-19 uh, created all of these shelter in place orders, uh, and we were glued to either television or the computer on social media to get information and feel connected to people. We all had the opportunity to collectively witness uh, what you might call a 21st century uh, law enforcement um, police lynching of George Floyd. And I think that, um, tended to uh, make us feel collectively responsible, particularly coming as it did after uh, questions that emerged during the pandemic about um, the, the, the nature of racism, the structural character of racism. Uh, uh, we, we recognized that black people and brown people were dying at a greater uh, rate than, than others. Uh, we began to realize that that the essential workers in our society are in fact people of color. Uh, these are the people who were losing their lives. These are the people who were paid the lowest wages. And, and as we were involved in this um, kind of prise de conscience about the nature of racism, we witnessed this lynching. And I think it had a powerful global impact. Um, and of course, vast numbers of people um, went out into the streets. Uh, it's important to point out, though, that this wasn't so much a spontaneous response as it was um, a, um, an effect of all of the amazing uh, organizing that has taken place over the last years, primarily by young people, feminist organizing, abolitionist organizing, uh, organizing against... Um, um, incarceration, mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex. Uh, and so 
it's it's um, it's actually amazing to be able to experience uh, 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 this moment, and I think there is a great deal of potential here. Uh, but of course, as with all such moments, it is up to us to do what is necessary in order to take advantage of the uh, potential. Mm -hmm. So, when we were talking just before we came on air, you were saying that. One fear would be that if the drama moved away from the situation, you know, when people come out of lockdown, when people re re recover the idea of some level of normality, we'll come back to what that might look like. But that's going to be when the work begins because you can sustain drama for only so long. After that, you have to return to the work. And as you said, this, this moment when everybody was sort of locked down and could see all together this moment, this murder, this lynching, this sort of symbolic but an, an actual realization of what we have been told and understood for years and years. It brought people out into the streets in this moment of radical impatience. Something has to change. And you know, for the first time in my lifetime, perhaps apart from South Africa and apartheid, I saw mm -hmm. white people standing up and saying, I insist that I count myself in on this struggle and I hold myself accountable for my sake, from the point of view of my moral conscience. And that is an important shift. But how to sustain it? It, it has to be through work. And how do we keep that struggle going? Well, as I was saying before, I think it's really important to acknowledge the work that mm -hmm. enabled uh, uh, these this massive response. Uh, uh, oftentimes, people assume that this that these kinds of things happen spontaneously. Uh, that that the protests, uh, uh, for example, in 2014 around the the police killing of Mike Brown in Ferguson happened spontaneously. Uh, but um, um, I, I I would argue that 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 people went out in the streets and began to participate in the demonstrations because they had already been touched by new discourses, uh, new organizing, uh, and 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 that um, the demonstration is a is a dramatic expression of of potential. Uh, uh, you know, I I, I like. Um, uh, what uh, John Berger has said about uh, demonstrations being uh, rehearsals for revolution, uh, um, but uh, the, the 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 work that will enable radical change to be institutionalized um, will happen in different venues. It will it will happen within institutions. It will happen in city councils. Uh, if if people are serious about abolishing the police as we know how policing, um, then that is going to require an enormous amount of work, uh, re-envisioning um, public safety, recognizing uh, the connection uh, between uh, physical and mental and spiritual health with safety, recognizing that uh, much of what the police is called upon to do, they cannot do. Uh, 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 it should be, we need to reconceptualize uh, uh, public safety and security and mental uh, health counselors need to be involved. Uh, we need to recognize that, that as, as members of communities, we have responsibility responsibilities also to intervene in ways that don't always involve calling the police. We need mm -hmm. to get the police out of our schools. Uh, police are in schools all over the country in the US. And I, I, I'm not sure whether this has happened in other places, but uh, this will be major if we are able to uh, guarantee that the police are no longer treating our young people as if they were criminals. I live in Oakland, California. In Oakland and in San Francisco, uh, de uh, decisions have already been taken to begin the process of, of ending the contractual relationship uh, with the police. In Minneapolis, uh, where George Floyd was killed, the city council there is in the process of 
trying to envision how one recreates uh, uh, public safety in ways that do not, in the very first place, call, uh, call upon armed humans uh, uh, to create that safety. So there's going to be an enormous amount of work over the next period. Uh, I'm, and I'm, I'm pretty optimistic uh, because the young people who've been doing the organizing in, in the U.S. in formations like uh, Movement for Black Lives, uh, the Dream Defenders, uh, um, in Brazil, uh, we have the example of, of, of Marielle Franco and all of the activity that was generated in response to her assassination. I know a, a work is happening in the UK and in Europe. Uh, in France, there's the, 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 the case of Adama um, Traore, his sister, uh, Asa Traore, has been doing an amazing job of giving leadership to the movement against police violence there. So I, I, I don't think that this can be stopped, this, this new radical wave of, 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 of uh, calls for a very different kind of justice. We've had some amazing young people during our 24 hour marathon so far, you know, 12 year olds, 14 year olds, uh, mm -hmm. very articulate, fully able to understand conversations about intersectional justice, fully able to say that their education system doesn't equip them and is inappropriate in terms of the curriculum, in terms of how they're taught history, in terms of how they're taught social justice. And talking about how within the school system themselves, they are gonna make change happen through the leadership of a 12 year old, a 14 year old. And so I agree with you wholeheartedly that there is a real sense that, uh, that young people are prepared to be leaders at an early age they are prepared to be radical at an early age and that the adults who somehow have said, well, is this appropriate? As if there's a kind of time gap you ought to live out before before you can have, have an act of citizenship, um, that this is breaking down too. And that the, the kind of idea of what is proper and nice and polite is now seen as complacent and inappropriate. So I think this language of activism, this purposefulness, this idea that you live by your values and that can never start early enough. I'm also seeing that not just in young people, but I suppose in them, um, in corporates, for example, you know, I'm seeing conversations happening at corporate level with women in particular coming out and saying either as, as white women like myself or women of color or black women, I'm not prepared to have uh, a kind of silence anymore about the things that need to be changed systemically inside corporate structures, inside society structures. I've never seen that courage before. I think that must be because we're, we're looking after each other, we're guarding each other's backs, or we're saying that somehow we believe this tide is unstoppable. And is that where your optimism is coming from? The fact that it's not just young people, but so many levels of society all speaking at the same time. Well, you know, um... Referring to the conditions here in the United States, so when uh, the current um, person who occupies the office of the presidency was elected uh, three and a half years ago, uh, there were those who were extremely depressed uh, about the implications uh, of of of, of um, electing him, and I and 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 I totally understand that uh, um, because he's been responsible for. Um, so much change within the the the, the judicial sense system, the appointment of conservative uh, judges, uh, uh, etc. Uh, but my an uh, analysis was uh, that um, that election was a desperate uh, cry to um, ignore the movement of history uh, and. And I, we know that the majority of voters voted against him. And I think that that, that um, um, notion of, of history moving in the direction of justice, uh, uh, beyond racism, beyond misogyny, uh, is, 
are ideas that have been taken up by vast numbers of people. And the election of the, the, the current occupant of the White House was this desperate cry to hold on to the past. Uh, uh, and uh, there were those who may have thought that that would work, but it is not working. One can see this uh, sense of, of wanting to move history in a progressive direction by the way people have challenged the symbols of the past, the symbols of white supremacy, the, the statues, the, uh, the, the products. Uh, you know, Aunt Jemima, who has survived for decades and decades and decades, uh, is no longer going to be with us. Uh, uh, Uncle Ben is going. Uh, um, so I, I think this um, this historical conjuncture is is one that uh, requires us to think about a very different kind of future. And in order to move forward, we definitely have to come to grips with the past. And people are finding all kinds of ways of expressing this. It is a, an extraordinary thing, isn't it, to think that there comes a time when history won't be stopped. It must move, as you say, towards a greater social justice. And the conversations that feel so fresh, they're not new, of course, they've been held for years and years and years in all sorts of places, but all of a sudden they're joining up together. And that I think is what people are finding so um, exciting and exhilarating. And taking the lead, I mean, I, I feel for the first time that the Black Lives Matter movement and the Say Her Name movement that have really tried to say, if we don't have social justice, it, social racial justice, we don't have a just world at all. I think that's being heard properly and for the first time. But I, I, I'd like to, in all the conversations we've been having about how do you get voices to be honest, open and um, you know, taking patience for history forward by calling out the past and saying things have to change. I want to just talk for a little bit about the people whose voices still are completely unheard. We've heard hardly anything in the media about women in incarcerated circumstances. It's uh, just on the tip of people's tongues now to talk about the dreadful situation with domestic violence, with domestic abuse. We're, we're talking about that in ways, again, that we haven't done before, but I still believe that we have left our people who are in incarcerated circumstances to fend for themselves, to have no real connection still with civil society. And I, and I want just to draw attention to that because I don't know what the situation is in the US, but in the UK, women who are usually serving less than a year in prison and almost always for nonviolent crimes are being locked up in COVID for 23 hours a day, uh, not having family visits except on Zoom. And, you know, again, this kind of inhuman way that we're separating out the prison population from the rest of everybody else, as if they don't belong and aren't part of us. And since you've done so much work in this area, I just wanted to, to speak on behalf of those women and ask you what is happening for them in the way that you're viewing things? Well, you know, first of all, um, of course there have been people who've been doing abolitionist work uh, for decades and decades. Uh, um, however, I, I don't know whether any of us would have, would have predicted that a pandemic such as the one we we're experiencing now would demonstrate that abolitionist strategies are the only ones that work, are the only way that one can uh, address uh, uh, the uh, facts that uh, jails and prisons are COVID-19 hotspots is through large-scale decarceration. People have to be released from prison. Women need to be released from prison. There was an an, an editorial in the New York Times two, uh, two days ago uh, that points out that currently in the US, the top five COVID-19 hotspots are correctional facilities. Uh, and that some um, 70,000 prisoners and 
prison workers uh, have been in, in, infected. Uh, the very uh, first woman imprisoned in a federal facility to die uh, was a woman by the name of Andrea Circle Bear uh, from the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. Uh, she had been taken to a federal prison in Texas and she died on April 28th, um, some two weeks after she had given birth. Um, and I think that uh, her death was a reminder to us that uh, especially here in this part of the world, our first allegiances should be to the first peoples of this country. Uh, women in prison are protesting and are demanding that they not receive a death sentence simply because of the refusal of administrative bodies to move swiftly to try to mitigate the dangers inside. Um, guards walk around prisoners without masks, uh, social distancing, and all of us have, are, of course, encouraged to engage in social distancing. But it is impossible within prisons because of the very architecture of incarceration. Uh, uh, people are being denied basic necessities uh, like soap. Um, as a matter of fact, a woman inside uh, the Ohio Reformatory for Women recently wrote to an activist on the outside indicating that um, in order to uh, minimize the impact of COVID-19, they only have two meals instead of three. One meal had been eliminated. Um, and because they've been denied things like toilet paper and, and cold medicine, they have to buy these things from commissary at unconscionably high prices, uh, which means, and this is what uh, she wrote, you choose between food and hygiene or medicine. No one should ever be forced to make that choice. Uh, just because we are incarcerated doesn't mean our health uh, doesn't matter. Uh, and of course, I, I think it's so important to focus on women in prison, not only because they are the ones who are usually forgotten, but because the experiences of women in prison help us to understand the intersectionality of um, institutional state violence and intimate uh, uh, violence. Uh, women in prison are uh, have provided insights uh, to uh, intellectuals and scholars who have studied the relationship between uh, various forms of violence and, and looking specifically at women's experiences gives us a different way of thinking about the entire system, the entire prison industrial complex. So I think this is an extremely important issue. One of the things that WOW does or tries to do always as a small charity is help all of us to be more educated about the things that we don't know about, to unlearn things that we thought we did know about, but we knew about it in the wrong way. And to realize that if we're only fighting our own battle, then not only are we not fighting enough of the story together, but we might even be actually fighting a battle that makes somebody else have something damaging happening to them at the same time. We have to have intersectional knowledge. And so some of you might be sort of thinking, well, you know, I don't know any woman in prison. That really isn't the point. The point is that the systemic nature of injustice plays itself out in so many different parts of society. And it's wonderful for all of us who have the privilege of joining together on these digital platforms because we have digital access, but many women don't and when many women are prevented from having access to anything. Uh, and we've got to be there for them, thinking about them and changing things on their behalf until they have the seat at the table which they deserve to have. Um, Angela, when you had a conversation with me last year, um, we were at the Apollo uh, in Harlem together, and you were talking very profoundly about the impact that women entertainers, women singers, women artists, women storytellers had had on the ability of social movements to, if you like, capture their lives, both 
personally in terms of loneliness or heart heartbrokenness or being abused but also you know songs of kind of warriorship if you like songs songs of struggle and what we're seeing at the moment with covid is that the arts are in danger of being ravaged uh, economically should that matter to us you know with hospitals and, uh, and care workers and all the terrible things that are going on sometimes it can feel like a kind of luxury to be able to say but we need to also support artists but i feel as if we need to gather around the, the the storytellers of the world and and make them know that we're there for them too yeah art is not a luxury uh, i i remember audrey lord's words when she said poetry is not a luxury it is a necessity art is a necessity we need art to illuminate the way to a different future. We need all kinds of art, visual art. We need films and images. We need music. We need collaboration among artists. Um, I, um, I have been doing some work with uh, a jazz drummer, Terry Lynn Carrington. She has a, a wonderful group called Social Science and it's a jazz hip hop group. They fuse music and politics. They take on issues of, of heteropatriarchy, homophobia, uh, racism, political prisoners. They have a wonderful album uh, of which uh, was just recently released. And I was telling her uh, that um, it's, it's, it, 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 it sounds like a soundtrack of the moment, uh, but of course it was done uh, years, some years before we actually I had the experience of, uh, of this pandemic and this upsurge in racial justice activism. I think, I think we have to demand that, that, that artists be subsidized by the state. I know this is the case in some countries, but not in the US uh, because artists are our lifeline. Uh, they are our hope. Uh, they allow us to feel what we do not yet know. And I think uh, the last time we spoke, uh, which was um, at the Apollo, um, just a little mm -hmm. over a year ago, right? Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I was, um, you know, talking about the fact, if I recall correctly, that 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 what I think is um, uh, most important about the history of Black people, particularly in this part of the world, the history of the African presence in the Americas, is is not so much all of the damage that was done, not so much um, the ways in which black people survived uh, violence and, 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 and slavery, but rather the fact that, that um, black people produce, them, produce beauty in the process, uh, uh, produce you know, wonderful uh, uh, music. And, 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 and to me, that is where the humanity uh, resides. We need art in order to remind us of our humanity. Artists are our lifeline. They are our hope. Um, and I, they allow us, as, as I always like to say, to feel what we do not yet know. And so art is essential. It is definitely not a luxury. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. Obviously, as a as a theatre maker, as a storyteller, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And all through the Wire 24 Hours, we have commissioned uh, musicians and artists and poets to create the Wow sounds. You'll have been hearing them on and off if you've been on the channel as long as I have, 14 hours so far, and we're still going. Uh, and if you'd like to support the Wow charity, the Wow Foundation, a small charity, press a donate button. Please help carry on supporting us because we're doing this for nothing in order to make sure that all women and girls have access without any financial barrier. But of course, we are paying our artists because they have to eat. And uh, all too often, we expect people to do free labor in all sorts of ways. And at the moment, freelance artists in particular are literally in free fall, as there are no circumstances in which their work can be paid for or present to a public. We, we have to give them the, but the financial support and also the kind of um, morale and solidarity that, as Angela says, that they really matter. So, Angela, it's been an amazing time, as you say, and you've 
said that in your lifetime, I think really what you're suggesting is that you've not witnessed anything that brought together a, a moment of so many things with so many different kinds of voices, all leading into this pivotal moment of historical change. And that that makes you optimistic. And certainly, you know, I feel that and I feel I'm having conversations with people that I, I've never had with before. Um, but going back to the idea that this didn't come out of nowhere, it was built on a lot of activism, built on lots of conversations over many years and a lot of organizing. Really what I, I'd like you to talk to is people out listening, the thousands of them from all over the world listening, um, people who haven't yet found themselves as part of an organizing scheme, people who haven't yet perhaps stepped over into a, a place called activism. How do you want people to pick up this moment and go forward? What, what, where do they begin? Well, my advice is um, always that uh, people should first um, consider um, their own um, talents, uh, uh, their own desires, their own proclivities, uh, uh, and they should figure out how they can contribute uh, and at the same time develop themselves. Uh, 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 so therefore, artists uh, can use their art to support movements. Uh, um, intellectuals can can use their 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 their, their writing and 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 their analyses uh, to uh, generate uh, more support. Uh, um, organizers, is, that's obvious. Uh, but of course, not everyone wants to do that organizing work. Some people find it extremely fulfilling. I find it fulfilling, but others think it's boring. Uh, uh, so I think uh, the question is, how can I um, express my own individuality uh, in the process of, 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 of supporting and pushing uh, forward a collective endeavor? And I mention this um, because, of course, the big elephant in the room is capitalism. And, and, and we haven't yet uh, uh, talked about racial capitalism in this conversation, but that is the big problem. And I think that ultimately we're going to have to uh, try to move to a different way of ordering our economies and ordering our societies that does not allow a few people with massive amounts of wealth to further uh, monopolize the wealth of, of the world. Um, uh, but I, 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 I think that um, in the meantime, we need to challenge the neoliberal uh, notions of individualism that, that uh, make us feel um, um, alone and, and solitary and make us feel as if all of our efforts have to be efforts of, of, of an individual. And I found personally that the things that I treasure most that I have accomplished aren't things that I've accomplished alone. They're, they're things that I've com accomplished in conjunction with, with, with others, uh, 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 building communities of struggle. And so I think people should ask how they might best be equipped to um, help generate more communities of struggle and at the same time develop their own individualities. I, I think that idea of um, jo the joy of both self-realization you know building on your own talents your own proclivities your your own sense that uh, you are you and you're allowed to be you you're allowed to love yourself and uh, realize your potential that is something that you have to be able to see your own worth but then to do that as part of collective action so that you can be of real use with others i agree with you there's so much joy if you can find a way of combining both of those things i i'm, I'm just a uh, not going to go away without having a little bit of a chew on this elephant in the room because uh, I think one of the things that we're realizing about this moment of COVID and Black Lives Matter is no more elephants in the room that can't be chewed into. Um, 
And, you know, I've had the most amazing conversation just before this, Angela, with Moody's and MasterCard and the World Bank, three brilliant women, all kind of saying, mm -hmm. we have to change the whole structure of the financial sector. And it has to be mm -hmm. all driven through the through a, a gender lens and a race lens. And until we do that, we won't have financial justice or equity or even a good financial system. Now, that's not a conversation I think I would have heard a few years ago. So again, in an optimistic sense, elephant or not, do you think the, the way that we've conducted global capitalism is going to come to an end in the way that you've suggested that, we, that history is making progress and it's unstoppable? Is there going to be a different kind of way of looking at power and money? Well, you know, I think we've reached the point um, where um, global capitalism is, is so uh, replete with internal contradictions uh, that, that in many ways it's in the process of destroying itself. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the fact that the pandemic had such a devastating impact uh, on healthcare was not so much about the pandemic, it was about the organization of healthcare and the uh, privatization of, 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 of hospitals and, and, and healthcare. Empty hospital beds are not profitable. And this was precisely the crisis that we experienced. Uh, and, and so the, 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 the privatization of healthcare, the privatization of education, the privatization even of of, of incarceration, especially the privatization of, de of, of immigrant detention facilities. Uh, um, we can no longer function as if profit were the most important uh, um, aspect of human reality. Uh, and of course, that is what the person in the White House uh, uh, assumes. Uh, uh, that is why that person is not even able to um, think about and to give expression to the real meaning of this pandemic and the uprising around racial justice and gender justice uh, that has occurred. I don't think we have any other choice. Uh, we have to move in a progressive direction. And hopefully, uh, just as people begin to recognize uh, that there was something seriously dangerous about cap capitalism during um, uh, the Occupy era. Uh, and we're talking about what, 2011 or so. Uh, and we acquired language that allowed us to talk about uh, uh, the uh, uh, fact that profit is valued more than people. Uh, we began to talk about the 1% and the 99%. Uh, and so I'm, 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 I'm hoping that that will continue and that we will recognize that in, in order to move in the direction of racial justice, in order to begin to carve out the, the structures of racism from the institutions of our, our society, we're also going to have to ask ourselves, how do we reorganize our economies? How do we make healthcare available to all? How can we create free education? How can we produce better schools? And these are the demands that underlie the call for defunding the police. It's not so much defunding the police um, and that's it. It's defunding the police in order to fund those aspects of our, our world that we require in order to um, uh, flourish as human beings. Okay, so everybody listening, don't expect the people who have the power and have put things in place so far to be the people who also then redo it all and make sense of it anew. Because what it's going to need is people like yourselves who wouldn't be up at 7 p.m. or midnight or 11 a.m. discussing and thinking about this if you didn't care about change happening. And you do care about change happening. So this is about what action can you take? What space do you want to take up? What position do you want to take up? What lobbying will you do? because the conversation is changing, but to sustain it and to organize it, it's a huge job. It's a kind of a post-war job across all sectors. 
but uh, Angela's telling us that it can be done. I'm going to believe her. I've never left a conversation with Angela without feeling that there actually is real reason for hope. Uh, that is not uh, naive to be hopeful, but actually it's a requirement of activism to be hopeful, but to have the evidence and, and put in place the work to make that hope a reality. Angela, you've been amazing to join us and thank you because I know you're doing so much labour at the moment for so many people in so many ways. I'm glad that you love it. I'm glad that it rewards you, but I bet it's tiring. Um, and um, and thank you very much as well for reminding us that we need beauty in our lives. We need a sense of purpose and joy and we need each other. Um, think, Let's think more together about how we can work for each other. And Angela, um, good luck with everything. I don't know whether you've come out of lockdown at all, but we'll meet again. I mean, Vera Lynn's just died, <laughs> but um, you know, we'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know when, etc. cetera. And, um, and, and thank you for all the work. We, we, we love you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jude. It's been um, a pleasure to participate in this conversation and I wish you and WOW all the best in the future.